So anyway, welcome to the Triangle Apache Spark Meetup. Uh, it's actually our only our second online meetup. We used to do that in person. And to be fair, I liked it when it uh, was in person. Uh, I still like it, <laughs> but I miss, I miss the human touch, uh, as I guess a lot of you as well. Um, the, ben the only benefit I see, which is a great benefit, is that we have more people from various countries, okay? So I see people from France here and, uh, and uh, maybe other places as well. So that's, that's, that's absolutely uh, great. Um, so, but without any further ado, you not, didn't come to hear me uh, to talk, uh, to hear me talk, and uh, you went to see Kevin and uh, Spark streaming. So Kevin, the floor is yours. And to make all things, I'm going to make you the host. So, Okay, Kevin, you're the host. All right. I control the vor vertical, I control the horizontal. You there we go. Everything. So, uh, looks like I am not going to be able to see chat while this is going. But um, that just says that hopefully, if you do drop things in chat, uh, Jean George will be able to uh, ask the questions. In the meantime, welcome everybody to getting started with Spark Streaming. My name, as mentioned, is Kevin Fiesel. I run a predictive analytics team in Durham. I am a Microsoft MVP in the data platform space. And I have a blog called Curated SQL. The idea behind Curated SQL is I try to find and link to five to 10 interesting posts per day about database development or administration, R, Python, Spark, Hadoop, Kafka, Scala, Power BI reporting services, or anything else in that broad data platform space. So that's curatedsql.com. So the main topic today is Spark Streaming. In order to understand Spark Streaming, we're gonna very briefly talk about a couple of concepts in Apache Spark. We'll na navigate over to the streaming options and I will show you three separate sets of demos. So we've got quite a bit to cover. Let's get started. Apache Spark comes out of UC Berkeley's AMP Lab, the Algorithms, Machines, and People Lab. 2009 was the first paper that was uh, released. Matai Zaharia and I think it was four co-authors releasing information on this distributed in-memory cluster system. Um, first publicly available release of Spark was 2010, and by 2012, Zaharia and I think it was up to about eight co-authors release a paper on resilient distributed data sets. The key word in there is in memory, because at about this time, remember Hadoop was taking off, but there were some issues around Hadoop, particularly in the fact that uh, every map operation in Hadoop meant retrieve data from slow disks, do some work, write data back to slow disks. Every reduce operation, get data from slow disk, do work, write data to slow disk. That slow disk was holding everything back. The assumption at the time was, we just have too much data, don't have enough RAM to cover this. But since then, we've seen the amount of RAM available in servers has exploded to the point where, hey, I can, I can uh, realistically expect a couple terabytes of RAM in a server without making too many heads explode. So, uh, memory is a lot less of a problem than it was in 2006. Let's talk back again about RDDs because understanding the nature of this data structure is going to get us through Spark as well as get us into Spark streaming. There are a few properties that make resilient distributed data sets really important to us. The first is that they are immutable. You never change the RDD itself. Instead, you apply a function that generates a new RDD. So this is a nod to the notion of functional programming. And there's a lot that comes with this, which I'm gonna kind of gloss over today, but it is important. Distribution, critical, it's part of the name. 
So we have these executors, these things that execute code, essentially. We give them data. We give them code to run. They run the code against that slice of the whole chunk of data. Unlike in Hadoop, where the data nodes are essentially giant repositories of information, where we give them some code and say, go search through your giant repository of information and give me back the results of this code. With Spark, the model is more of, we have data stored someplace, not necessarily on the machines executing this code. Instead, those machines are, we treat them as, this is compute, not compute plus storage tied together. Which has actually helped out a lot in, in our uh, cloud world where storage and compute have become more and more separated. But we give them code, we give them data. That amount of data ideally is smaller than what they need, what they have in terms of memory. They give us back the results we want. There's resiliency also in the name, so it's got to be important. If an executor fails, the driver, which is our air traffic controller, it's the thing keeping these executors in line. It's uh, what gives them their jobs, what takes away information and returns back to us as developers or as users. It says, here's where your info is. The driver can, if an executor is falling down on the job, if it does not respond in a timely manner, if uh, there's an indication that the machine has died, can contact another executor and say, all right, here's the data, here's the code that this executor had. Go ahead, take it, give me back the results. So it is resilient to failure. A machine failing, an executor failing, won't uh, impact other executors, won't take down and stop your queries from running. So as developers, we don't have to think as much about uh, the specific hardware behind it. We don't have to think as much about how are we going to bring everything back together because there's a lot of code that was written to handle that for us. Finally, they're lazy. Executors try to minimize the number of data changing operations they do, which gives us the capacity to say have optimization where we can send a query or send a set of instructions, a set of code in and have an optimizer look at this and say, well, if I perform these operations in this order instead of the order I was given, uh, it'll actually be faster. Pretty nice thing that you can bring in. It's something that's pretty common in say, uh, relational database engines. They have cost-based optimizers. They have ways of rewriting that SQL code and turning it into a set of instructions that hopefully is the best set of instructions for retrieving the data, operating on it, giving us back what we want. So all of these properties together make up the core data structure around Spark. When we want to talk about streaming, you start with that core data structure, the RDD, and you add one additional element, time. So the mental model that you can think of is you have a stream of time, and during the stream of time, you can uh, imagine it being broken up into RDDs that exist over that point in time. So in the image here, we have different uh, data sets that make up a, a certain amount of time. We can operate on this in one of two ways. One, which I can call the I don't know, classic Spark streaming way. Each RDD is independent. We operate just on that thing. And then when we're done with that, we wait for the next one to come in. We operate on it we wait for the next one to come in. The other method, you can think of it as uh, more of a, a total history. So at the beginning, we get back one set of information that is for the time period up to that point one. And then uh, we operate on it. A little bit later, we, we can get a data structure that represents the entirety of time up to point two. 
Later on, uh, we get the entirety of time up to 0.3 and can operate, say, we're looking at um, aggregates across the entire time frame. So there's a couple of models in here. This is a structured streaming model, and I'll talk about what that means in a little bit. But going back to the core concept, uh, we have this thing that is an RDD that is time aware, and we call that a D stream. Instead of imagining our data as static, as it's just there and then we access it and it's sort of timeless in that regard, uh, we have to instead think about a forward-looking flow of data. So I'm going to have this application and it will get new information in the future and we are specifically uh, anticipating that information as it comes in. To maximize performance, instead of getting each message individually created and operated on, like you might see in, say, Kafka Streams or an Apache Flink, there's more of a micro-batching approach. So wait a relatively small amount of time and build a resilient distributed data set over that chunk of time. Uh, this has the advantage of meaning that you don't have quite as much overhead. You can amortize the overhead of creating an RDD and uh, shipping it out, the network costs, over more records. So it can be a net benefit over time as long as you, know, you don't necessarily need things right this moment. If you can wait a second or 500 milliseconds, then this approach can be much more efficient. So this was with classic Apache Spark, if I remember right, um, 0 0.7 was about when Spark streaming came out to the public. And there was quite a bit of work on it since then. With Apache Spark 2.0, we have this model shift from focusing on resilient distributed data sets to focusing on uh, the dual metaphors of data frames and data sets. So a data set in Scala terms, it's an RDD that is strongly typed. So we have a data set, which might be a resilient distributed data set of some car class or some person class or uh, something like that. In Scala, a data frame is a data set of type row. So the class is row and rows are special because they have named columns. So we're getting basically to the point where, wait, I have a, uh, a set that has like rows and columns and named columns. And now it's starting to sound suspiciously like a table, which works really well with Spark SQL. In the Python and R worlds, it's a little bit different because they don't have data set as such. Uh, they just have data frames, which are still named columns, that tabular structure. Um, so across the board, that's why we think of data frames, because now everybody, if you're using R, Python, Scala, Java, you can think of it in those terms. Uh, specifically in Scala, we can think in terms of data sets as well. So where is that special? Well, uh, data sets and data frames give us a couple advantages over working with the RDDs themselves. First, I kind of gave away some of the game. We get this native SQL support. And when, you know, when analysts generally know SQL, a lot of developers know SQL, it becomes a lot easier to work with in terms of like cross developer experience. Uh, SQL is a very, very good domain specific language for working with data. We also get compile time errors. Particularly in Scala, you get with data sets, you get compile time errors around uh, having perhaps the wrong data type for an attribute. Uh, you get compile time errors around, well, column should be here, but it's not there, or it should be used in this way, but it's not available. Instead of having everything be runtime errors, which was more the result with uh, RDDs, you know, you can fix some things up front. And the more that we can fix up front, the more the, the compiler can help us, 
the better our code ends up as a result. Sometimes you can get better performance. It's not a guarantee. There are cases when RDDs will just give you better performance. Uh, you can write code better than what the uh, data frame would translate back down to. But there are other times when that optimizer can kick in and you can end up with code that is faster working with data frames and data sets than when you're working with RDDs. Now, data sets and data frames are not, strictly speaking, they're not streaming concepts. They're just Spark concepts. But the application of these data frames in Spark streaming gets us to the idea of structured streaming. And uh, that's something that I want to explore in our examples that are coming up. Before I can get to that example, we do have to do a brief primer on the concept of windows. Spark streaming implements two specific types of window, a tumbling window and a sliding window. So let's say I have a stream of events over time. They're on the screen here. Everything that's marked E1 is an event that happens over time. The first type of window I want to talk about is a tumbling window. The idea with this tumbling window is we have non-overlapping intervals of events. So we can see the different colors represent different windows and the beginning of one window is the end of the prior window. So we have no overlap in events, ideally. Uh, in practice, there can be weird things that happen where you get events more than once. Um, but we're gonna talk ideal world, you get an event once, you handle it once, things are worked on just at one time. There's no overlap. But sometimes you want overlap, and that's where sliding windows come into play. So a sliding window has two parameters. The tumbling window has one parameter. They both have the same parameter of window size, and that is the size of the box here the red box or the blue box. A sliding window has a sliding window interval. So here, my box size, let's say that my box size is 30. Uh, my sliding interval might be 20. So um, I have a window that can hold events up to 30 seconds. After that window is filled, we would move it over 20 seconds. And now, instead of time 0 to 30, we track time 20 to 50. And then when we get to there, we slide the window over again, 20 more seconds. This is helpful if, for example, you want to smooth results over time. Uh, suppose you're working with error rates, and you don't necessarily want big, nasty spikes because that can confuse algorithms. You might want to smooth it out to see if there's a, a trend. Uh, that's one example of where a sliding window becomes useful. Incidentally, what is interesting about the way that uh, Spark implements this, that under the covers, it's the same method, it's just that there are two parameters. A tumbling window is a sliding window where the window length is equal to the window interval. So if you have a a uh, sliding window of 30 seconds and a window interval of 30 seconds, you just have a tumbling window. So that is a clever way of getting two window types out of one function. Any questions so far? I don't see anything. Seems the things are pretty clear. Excellent. That's, that's what I like to hear. People have been beaten down into not asking questions. Uh, so let's get into our first Spark streaming example. This is a fairly simple one. It's about as simple as you can get. This is Hello World with a DStream. So our first bit of information is we create a new streaming context. This is uh, Apache Spark. I'll call it Spark 1.0. We still we work with contexts. The streaming context is running against a local Spark cluster with all CPU cores. The app is called Hello Spark Streaming, and that third parameter is saying that our 
window is one second. Our, our micro batch size is one second. So I'm going to pull in a new RDD every second. I'm going to get this information from a socket. So I'm opening up port 9999 on localhost and I'll feed data into there. The next action is to perform a flat map. A flat map basically takes uh, one input, here, I'll, I'll do it with my left hand so that uh, it actually looks right on the camera. One input, zero or more outputs. So the way that we can do this, we split our line of text. So I'm going to take in whatever interpreted as text, as lines of text, and split them on space. So now I have one line of text that comes in, which gets converted to multiple words, each of which is its own element. So that's the flat map. It's split pivot. Uh, then we will map, which is a one-to-one -one result. For every row, or excuse me, for every word, I will perform an operation to lowercase. Uh, we do have to worry about case sensitivity in this application, so I'm going to lowercase it. I could also do things like removing punctuation. I could uh, try to make this more complicated, maybe remove, remove uh, certain words, tokens, um, you know, stop words that are not necessarily interesting. But incredibly simple, hello world. I'm just going to make it lowercase. And finally, count. We count by value. How many times does a word appear? That's classic Spark. Two more words make this Spark streaming. Count by value and window. So what this is saying is, over a specified window of time, we will get the count of words, or yeah, the count of um, number of times a word appears. Our specified window says, the window size will be 30 seconds. The window slide interval will be five seconds. So we have a 30 second capture point and every five seconds we're gonna, after we get uh, to 30, we're gonna slide it over five seconds. Finally, we've got word count. So we've, we've got the window that's filled up. We're going to take the results of that window, that set of key value pairs of word is the key, number of occurrences is the value, and we will sort it by the value descending, which is that, what that false represents. This is saying, do you want this ascending? The answer is no, we want it descending. And print the top 10. So in other words, get the, word, get the count of occurrence by word, load in the top 10. And then every five seconds that window moves, so the set of words will differ. Here's our second example. Hello world with structured streaming, with the use of data frames, the use of the Spark 2 concepts. We start off with a Spark session instead of the context. So now we're working with session. Um, this will be running against a local cluster. This time I said I only want three cores. Uh, our app name, a little bit different, and we call Gitter Create. What is nice about this is that if, if I already have the session, all right, well, it's, just, it's not gonna recreate the session for me. So if um, I'm running this code in a loop or if I'm, if I'm uh, waiting for new information to come in, it doesn't have to constantly rebuild the session. Session is just there. I'm going to get a data frame back. I'm gonna get a data frame from reading a stream. In our Hello World DStream example, I had a specific type, I had a socket type. Here, I have a stream. I just, whatever that stream is, the format of the stream is socket, and we send in options, key value pairs. There are several formats that are built into Spark. So I can say, read from Kafka, I can read from sockets, I can read from other locations. 
if I have the appropriate third-party drivers, I can read from other data sources as well. Those are all handled with read stream. I'm going to take that stream and we'll perform a very similar operation uh, to get word counts. This time though, we're using the SQL, the Spark SQL uh, syntax, which means that I have my uh, data frame, which has keys and values. I just care about the value. Um, we technically have keys. I believe a key is all going to be blank because I didn't specify it uh, when reading from the stream. So I only care about the value. That value is a line of text. That line of text, I'm going to split it on spaces that creates an array of all of the words. We're going to explode that array to take it and pivot into a uh, set of results. Instead of an array, we have multiple uh, rows. In other words, we just perform that flat map that we did in the first example. Group by word, give me the count. And we'll write to an output. We're gonna write to the console. We're going to start our application, we'll await termination. So that's the gist of the code. Let's get into looking at how everything actually works. So here I am in IntelliJ IDEA. I know that the bar on the left will be a little small, but I will pop, I will make the code itself large enough for everyone to see. That's good. Okay. This is essentially the same code that I showed you in the slides um, with a couple of extra things like, no, I seriously don't want to be blasted inundated with messages that, uh, info messages from Spark. But otherwise, we read from the socket text stream, we perform our uh, group by, we perform our counts, and we sort those. This checkpoint, I will call it out and um, say that I'm not gonna get into too much detail. The real, or the gist of it is I can write to a checkpoint directory, I can manage that, and if my application fails, Spark can pick back up where it left off, which is quite helpful for us, uh, but it's also outside the scope of where I wanna get into with a getting started talk. I think it's uh, after this talk, if you're really interested in going, uh, learning a bit more about Spark, uh, excuse me, about Spark streaming, definitely checkpointing is one of the next steps to go to. We will start our streaming application and wait until something happens to make it go away. Uh, specifically, wait until I kill it. So, I'm going to say, run hello Spark streaming. While that's going on, Let's open a uh, new port in cat. So go. I've installed in cat on windows. It does not come with windows by default. If you're using Linux, it's in C, or you can also install in cat. This is made by the same people who make in map. And what we can see right here is that I've successfully got a connection. There have been no words so far. So let's type in some words. There we go. We're getting in, reading this stream that's just an open socket, getting results, lowercase grouping, aggregating. You can see that, for example, out with a period shows up once. And what I'm gonna do is vamp for just a little bit because I wanna show you that this changes over time as we slide our window further and further away. So words had five entries at this point and is now gone because I haven't been typing the word words lately. Now everything's gone. So we have our window just moving on and on. And because we don't have any words inside that current window of, I believe I said five seconds. Yep. Um, so we don't have anything in this 30 second frame. 
because we've, we've moved along enough times, it's now empty. But as soon as I add more words in, we're going to see them show up. So very simple example, but it gives you an idea of the concepts of working over time and that all of the work in here, I didn't have to think about, well, what happens if uh, there's no work, if there's nothing that comes in for some amount of time or trying to think about the time itself. The RDD is time aware, but I just write this code as though it is a, an RDD that I got like anything else. You know, lines is uh, the receiver input D stream. So it is effectively, I can treat it like an RDD that I've received at this point in time and then operate on it independently of um, other stuff that has come in. So it's really useful. I don't have to think about the complexities of streaming data, of uh, blocking and writing. That stuff's handled for me. I just have to think about how am I intending to consume this? The data frame example is you know, very similar in concept. I have my session. I have a stream that I read and the stream that I read just gives me back a data frame. I don't have to think about how I got to the data frame or how I will get to the next data frame. That stuff's handled as part of read stream. So very helpful for me as a developer because I can use any concepts that I've been using uh, when working with data frames before. You know, instead of it being backwards looking data, it's just forward looking. I've still got my socket open. So with this version of the data frame, one thing I wanna call out is that I don't sort it. It's not exactly the same code as the first example but I can take it a little while. That's because by default, the I did not set a um, stream window size. So it's going to hold for, if I remember right, it's either 30 seconds or one minute. But after that point in time, we're gonna see a blank window. And then after that, I should start seeing my data. And because I don't specify a uh, slide interval, it will be the same as my, my window size. Um, I'm just gonna wait until I get the second batch because I should get all of those words that I typed in aggregated. Here we are. So there we go. Uh, it's not sorted or anything, but we do see the word words shows up three times. Bad is it shows up one time. So I get to work with that data like it's any other uh, data frame. Questions on the early demo. I don't see any questions. Excellent. We, we have either a very sleepy audience or a very, or a very talentful speaker. I would go for the speaker. <laughs> I was the sleepy audience. Hey, I, have, I have a question actually. So what is the exact use case of the, the Spark streaming? I mean. Uh, so what is, what is uh, the use case of Spark streaming? It is ideally when you need information that is, say, regularly processed, is frequently processed, you can't necessarily wait for a longer batch operation to complete. So uh, historically with warehouses, think of data warehouses where I load the warehouse every night and it has yesterday's data. So that way when people uh, receive, they run their reports, they see data up to yesterday. The, that's kind of classic data analysis. When I want something that's a, a lot more up to date, I want to see data as of right now, or I need to be able to act on something 
immediately, where immediately is scare quotes and like within a couple seconds, then spark streaming can be extremely useful. Uh, as an example, if I have a, a workflow for say I'm processing an order, I may, if I'm, if I'm a large enough company, I may get a lot of orders in. So I may have this streaming pipeline where orders are received, they're sent into my Spark streaming setup, and I can do checks, make sure we have enough quantity on hand, uh, make sure that this looks like a valid order, make sure that everything was marked correctly, the shipping address is correct, make sure that the amount that the person uh, paid actually is what we expected it to be. They didn't modify the cart somehow. So I can have this stuff happening in near real time. I can operate on things in uh, small groups over time and not have to learn the intricacies of additional event handling uh, languages or frameworks. So that's, that's the really generic answer for where Spark streaming can be very useful. Okay. So, so, I mean, is there a difference between Apache NIFI? I mean, NIFI, we have something called Apache NIFI, right? I mean, does... Yes, so NIFI, NIFI um, fits into, in a way, it fits into this, this area as well. Um, I don't consider it quite the same as Spark Streaming or Kafka Streams or Flink. Um, NIFI, to me, has more of a feel like ELT. Uh, I'm going to extract data from some source and load it into somewhere else. So I'm pulling sensor data use, using maybe Minify, and then I'm going to write it into uh, HDFS so everybody can work with that sensor data over time. You, still get, you can still get that real-time or near-real-time streaming through NIFI, yes. So it is... Uh, in some ways, a substitute for what we're doing with Spark Streaming. Um, it just, it always, maybe it's my biases where I look at NiFi and I think of Informatica or integration services and think of it as mostly a, like a batch data movement tool. So that could just be me being biased about it. But, um, yeah, I can I can see where you can you can make a comparison that it's it's in a similar space. And I can so, I, if if I if I can add is a there's a lot of different streaming framework in uh, and tools around there. You can think also about Kafka streams and things like that. But the big benefit of having that running into Spark is that you've got these unified APIs through the data frame. So your application and your application logic will work uh, in a very seeming, seeming less way. And you can have, you only have to learn one tool and not a bazillion kind of tools. So that's also a big benefit when you've got a, a team of developers. Yeah, that's a good point. Can I use? I mean, can I use uh, Apache Stream, uh, Apache Spark instead of Apache NiFi? I mean, to extract the data from the external data sources. I do that all the days, all every time. I okay. do that very often. Yep. Whether it's streaming or 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 non-streaming, batch batch wise. Uh, this is Deepak here. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. How you doing, Deepak? Hi, hi, Kevin. Hi. Um, so, is Spark streaming um, compatible with a cloud infrastructure or a cloud deployment, like maybe AWS? So, is Spark streaming compatible with uh, cloud infrastructure. Short answer is yes. Um, longer okay. answer is also yes. <laughs> okay. So, Spark streaming is available within Databricks. Uh -huh. um, you could also like have you could even have EC2 or Azure VMs that are that are running Apache Spark and uh, be able to stream to run streaming applications from there. Essentially, it just needs to be able to connect to some source. Like in the code example, 
Um, if if you're doing this the v, the VM way, mm-hmm. actually, even within Databricks, even even if you have it within a notebook or a pipeline, um, you need to be able to connect to a host. That host name, you know, it doesn't have to be localhost. It's just my demo, but you can have it be go connect to uh, this endpoint and read from that endpoint. So if I have, for example, a Confluent cluster that is available in Confluent Cloud, I can go hit that endpoint, stream in data um, in Databricks and be able to process it. Thank you. I don't have an example of that today, but it is certainly uh, an option. So, so right. Kevin, yeah. one last question, Kevin. So, I mean, you showed us the code, right? I mean, uh, in which language the code was written? I mean, is it uh, JavaScript or? This is Scala. Yeah, nobody's oh, okay. perfect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's going to get better. It's going to get better once we get to uh, section five. Oh, okay, thanks. So, yeah, this is Scala. You could also write the code in Python. You could write it in Java. Um, you could even work with it in R, uh, but that is my example today, Scala. All right, let's talk about a fuller program. So, you know, I showed you, hey, here's, here's reading from a socket. In production, you're probably not going to read from many sockets because there are a few problems with that. You know, sockets don't have any sort of endpoint security. Uh, sockets don't have encrypted data. You're not decrypting the data. It's just there. Um, if somebody closes a socket on you, the application complains and may die. So realistically, we have actual proper data sources where we're feeding in data most often. One of those proper data sources is Apache Kafka. And there's some tight integration availability within uh, Spark to work with Kafka. We're going to output this into a Cassandra database because let's say our analysts understand that really well and want to work with it um, instead of trying to work directly with Spark. So we'll use, in this case, Spark streaming as essentially an ETL process to take data from Kafka over time and push it into Cassandra. Let's look at the demo for this. Also in IntelliJ, this is another project in here. And the key file is this job. Um, Before I get too far into the job, let's run a little bit of code. Um, I am going to start up a Confluent cluster. So I've already, I've got instructions, by the way, I'll give you the uh, URL at the end where you'll be able to replicate this on your own if you'd like. But I wanted to start up my Confluent cluster. Um, I want to start up a Docker container with Cassandra in it. So in here, port 9042 is the application port for uh, Cassandra. 9160 is the, um, if I remember right, that's like the host listener. And I've got both of these images up and running. I'm also going to do one more thing. That is to, that's not what I'm looking at. This is a VM that needs minimized. There we go. Okay, Visual Studio Code. I probably have to restart it. We're gonna find out. But there's a Cassandra workbench. And that workbench sometimes works for me. Uh, we're going to see if it'll, if it'll work this time. I'll close this editor. Maybe that'll help. Create a new file. And create a key space called public. It's like creating a schema. Yep, no host available. Okay, I need to restart Visual Studio Code. That's easy enough to do. Go back to the workspace.
Go back to the workbench. Click the thing correctly. Let's try to run this one more time. Okay, restarting Visual Studio Code worked. So I created a key space public, and I'm going to create a table called car. Car has a name, number of cylinders, number of um, horsepower. By the way, this is the same as the MT cars data set in R, um, but it's just taken out and made available elsewise. So I have this table called car. If I select star from car, got no results. It's exactly what I would expect at this point. In the meantime, my confluent cluster should be starting up. So I'm going to connect to localhost 9021. That's the confluent host uh, point. And I need to add a topic. I'm going to call this topic car. Uh, I can create however many part partitions I want. Let's do 12, just because I can. Okay, everything's prepped, everything's ready to go. Now let's read some code before I kick things off. Uh, this is our main object. So we have a main object, we have a main method where we're going to start we're going to build a Spark session and call it Integrating Cassandra. We're going to run it locally using up to two cores. We're going to connect to a Cassandra connection localhost. Native port is 9042. RPC port is 9160. So you may ask, wait, where does this stuff come from? How, do, how does Spark know how to do this? And these right now, these are just configuration things, but how is it going to know how to connect to Cassandra? The answer is in the build.sbt file. So in here, this tells me I'm using a Scala version 2.12.12. Spark 3 is installed on this machine. We want to use the Cassandra connector for Spark 3, which is, by the way, still in beta. I'm going to use Kafka version 2.3. That's the version of the Kafka that is running on the latest version of Confluent platform. So let's pull in org.apache.spark for core, SQL, and streaming. I used those actually in the prior demos as well. Um, when I want to connect to Kafka, I'll bring in org.apache.kafka. When I want to integrate Spark streaming with Kafka, I need to bring in this library for uh, Apache Spark, the Spark SQL Kafka cross connector. And for Cassandra, their uh, data stacks, the professional organization, creates this. So bring in all of my libraries, uh, set up my configuration, and then call this runjob.run. So runjob is up here. It has a run method. That run method retrieves data, does work, writes data. Retrieve data, get information from a Kafka topic and give me back a data set of car. So let's first hop into where read from Kafka topic lives. And it says, okay, well, you've given me a Spark session. I would like to read a stream formatted for Kafka running on localhost available at port 9092. That's where the broker lives. Subscribe to a topic called car and start at the earliest offset. Um, now this is going, actually, this won't read historical data in the Kafka topic. It's just going to read whatever's been added since the application starts. That's why I haven't loaded any data yet. We're going to load data as it comes in. It's going to create data frames. We're going to take what comes in and create value. So cast value as a string and call that value. Drop the key. Um, you know, Kafka does have key value pairs. We're not going to use the key in this example. And finally, 
convert the input from JSON to a car schema type. So if I look at car schema, it's basically saying, this is how you build a car. This is a case class in Scala. It's, an, it's a class in Java. Um, we have different attributes here. We have you know, like name, miles per gallon, horsepower, uh, weight in pounds, I believe. Actually, horsepower and cylinders, I believe, were the two additional attributes that we're going to collect. So we're grabbing this information from the JSON file. Here's what the JSON file looks like. We have just standard JSON. Um, we have all of these attributes defined for vehicles. So that stuff comes in, loads through Kafka. As Kafka has these messages, uh, passes along messages to Spark Streaming. Spark Streaming takes those messages and converts the message into a data set of these. That's what we output. That's where we get car data set. From there, we can work with car data set. I can extend it further and uh, enrich it with other data sources. I can modify, I can reshape, do whatever I need to do with these data sets of cars. What I'm going to do is just take it as is and write to Cassandra. So I'm gonna send in the car data set and the Spark session. Writing to Cassandra says, all right, you have a data set of cars or a data frame of cars. We're going to write those data frame or write the values of those data frames out someplace. And here's how we're going to write it. For each element in the data set, we need one of these. A car Cassandra for each writer. So let's, let's take a look at this. Here I've got public as the key space, car as the table. Here's my connector. Um, the Cassandra connector, basically go look in the configuration that we set up to find out the, the host and the ports. And for a for each writer, we need to have open process close. Um, because we're handling opening the connection to Cassandra separately. The open method here essentially just doesn't do anything. It says, hey, we opened a connection. But the connector is actually handling opening and closing connection to Cassandra. That's why we don't have anything special in open or close. For process, however, process is you get a car and you need to do something with it. Don't give me back anything. So, okay, what we're going to do is execute on the session. So we have a Cassandra session and insert into Cassandra these values. And then we don't return anything, we're good to go. So if I run this, um, let's, if it works. Did have a few problems with this particular demo when I was trying it out on Sunday, but I think most of those were uh, of the PebCAC variety. So we're gonna see if it does better today. All right, so right now it's setting everything up and notice how it's just blasting us with messages. Basically all it's saying is, I am currently reading from Kafka and it says I have nothing new to do. So I'm going to give you a message that says I have nothing new to do. So let's give it something new to do. And I believe it's in here. Yep, we are going to write to Kafka the contents of cars.json. So I run that all of a sudden as this actually starts getting written to Kafka and then sent over to Spark Streaming, this quiets down a little bit. It's like, oh, okay, I had stuff to do. And then it, you know, says, oh, I'm done doing stuff. So since it says it's done doing stuff, let's go look at public.car and we have our results. 
So we're able to take those messages from Kafka. We're able to batch them up kind of behind the scenes, write those results out to Cassandra, and we're good. If I have more cars that I load in, maybe I have a cars2.json, I would get more records in here. And we could just keep this, this application going. It will keep pulling from Kafka to uh, Cassandra. And then people can do whatever they do in Cassandra. I don't know. I don't, I don't really use Cassandra much. But uh, that's just one example of I have some input. I have some output. As long as we have good Spark connectors, we can pull data in, work on it however we need to, and get it going. The last thing I want to cover fairly briefly, uh, .NET and Spark streaming. So there's a library, Microsoft.Spark, that allows us to execute .NET code as DLLs or executables against a Spark cluster. Supports C Sharp and F Sharp. We use only the Data Frames API, only Spark structured streaming, so no D streams. You can bring in additional libraries against your Spark cluster. You can use Maven to pull new stuff in. And you can even debug this code with Visual Studio Code or Visual Studio itself. That said, there are some downsides. Um, if you do need DStreams, there are cases where a DStream makes sense. No support. Spark version support tends to lag. Currently, the latest version they support is 2.4.5. Uh, in the two line, 2.4.6 is the latest. And then there's Spark 3, which is currently not supported. And if you do get errors, handling them can be painful. Um, so let me show you briefly, very briefly, because I know we're getting close to 1 o'clock. And where am I looking? I'm looking at run spark.net demo. So what we're going to do is I have a Docker container that has my code in it. I'm going to uh, restore packages and build the code, and we can run a .NET runner. This .NET runner is a class that Microsoft has created as part of the Microsoft.Spark library. It lives in this jar file that we have to include. The jar file is specific to the um, second level version of Spark. So they have one for 2.3 and they have one for 2.4. Runs against our local cluster. And then it says, okay, once you have this, I would like you to run the application in this folder, run this project and pass in a parameter, uh, structure streaming dot repeater. That in program.fs, this is F sharp by the way, um, will no to call repeater.fs. And repeater.fs, here's what the code looks like. This is almost exactly the same as the Scala code, except that we're using Pascal case instead of camel case. So capital G, capital B, like in .NET. So we're going to read a socket. We're going to write to the console. Let's briefly kick that off. If I remember which console is the one that I have, here we go. Uh, I'm going to call it GSWSS. We'll have bash. Um, I need to then connect to bash in here. Oh, it's already in use. Okay. There we go. I stopped the container, but I didn't delete it. And because I'm naming one the same, that was a no-no. All right. Let's open up port 9999. And I just have to uncomment out the command that I want to run. Save run. We're going to kick off Spark and we'll connect over the socket. Take just a moment.
here it even says, you know, you shouldn't use sockets uh, for production apps. But all I'm doing is taking whatever is typed and repeat it. So it's a extremely simple application to take from a source, push to a destination. That destination happens to be the console. But that source you know, could be from a Kafka cluster. We use the same concepts. We just have to make sure that we have those uh, libraries installed. So if you want to learn more about Spark and .NET, check out those examples. As we follow up from here, I think the next things that are interesting after the getting started, learning about watermarking, learning about late arriving data, because data won't always arrive exactly when you want it to, and it may fit in a particular window. It may have a time, a time stamp that was earlier. So how do you work with that? Spark has ways. Uh, checkpoints, recovery from failure. I just briefly talked about the concept, but there's a lot to get into there. And also Spark SQL has its own set of window functions that go a bit beyond what uh, relational databases tend to do and gets into more of like what InfluxDB and time series databases uh, can get into. If you'd like to learn more, grab the slides, grab the code, links to additional resources, walk through the whole .NET examples. Those are just containers you can easily download. Go to csmore.info slash on slash spark streaming. If you have any follow-up questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to me, email or Twitter handle. I know that it is lunchtime and people have to get back to work, so I wanted to end as close to one o'clock as possible. With that, thank you all so much. Well, thank you, Kevin. I hope uh, everybody has got a, a, for a few minutes more because we've got a few questions for you now. Uh, people are less shy. Uh -huh. um, so uh, one, one question from Hammond. Uh, how do you make a Spark streaming app full tolerant? And you've got to be like tw 12 seconds to answer this one. I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? How do you make a Spark streaming app fault tolerant? Fault tolerant? So actually I have a link. Um, I have a link in the resources if you go to csmore.info on Spark streaming. Uh, Databricks has an entire demo, or they have an entire page on the kinds of stuff that you can do to make it production ready. That includes some uh, topics on fault tolerance. So I would, I would push readers over there instead of whatever foolishness I could come up with. Next question is, if I want to use multiple readers and multiple writers, let's say 50 of each, I have to pull all the code in only one job or exists a better way to do this? That's a good question. I'm thinking about, I guess, I guess you could have cases where you have a lot of readers and writers, but it just feels awkward that like having so many writers and readers and one. I, I don't want. I don't want to mention this this marvelous book here, but uh, in 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 chapter ten, uh, there's a way to actually do multiple uh, multiple readers in. And because, because as you as you showed, the await method is blocking, but there's a there's an alternate method to use, and uh, um, and you can have multiple sources at the same time. Like uh, if you want to do like an aggregation of multiple sources or joins between between multiple sources. So there's Great. Some. There's your answer. Chapter ten of Spark in Action. <laughs> uh, okay, I didn't mention it. Uh, and a question is from, uh, from Lance as well. Uh, do you recommend Cassandra as a sync? If not Cassandra, what is the simplest sync target? Um, so in this case, yeah, Cassandra, oh, it's still going. I, I guess I can stop this now. Um, in this case, yes, Cassandra was the sync. And you can tell that because, hey, it's a, it's a write stream. So basically we're saying we're going to write it and here's, here's where we're going to write it handled in this process method.
Um, so that was, that's an example of a slightly more complicated sync. Like the really easy type of sync, for example, here is a console sync where, well, let's do data frame. Format console, just write it out. Um, so that's the trivial example of a sync. Okay, uh, and Emans, would you demo the what next features too? Uh, I don't think we have the time right now to demo them. Yeah, sorry. Uh, if, if there's a, some interest and you can ping me, we can do an advanced streaming. That was supposed to be an introduction. I think we went pretty deep as already. Um, and uh, there is a, a typo on your link or something. I'll, I'll put that in the meetup notes as well. So, so that, uh, yeah, you forgot the O N uh, Lu Luan in the, in the, in the link. Uh, um, but I, I'll put that, I'll put that in the, in the notes as well. Um, hey, Kevin, on time, just a little bit late, uh, but it's great. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, that was a great talk. We were not that many people, but at least it's passionate people. So, so at least that's, that's, that's even better sometimes than uh, uh, thousands of people coming for and, and no feedback, no interaction. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, you can reach Kevin as he, sh he shared his coordinates and uh, is a regular on the Spark Meetup. Uh, next month, we will have uh, uh, Deepak from uh, Dirash uh, from uh, sorry Dirash from uh, DataQ, and we will see a little bit about data quality in Spark, and that's 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 going for the next month. Uh, Kevin, once more, thank you very much, and the recording will be available soon. Bye, guys. And thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you. All right, thanks.